All right, let's do number four. We'll do it because it's a double debit. So let's see if we can make it right, all right? So it says, House in the County is closing on September 28th, all right? And then taxes have not been paid uh, for the year. The home is listed for 425,000 and the assessed value is 410,000. The county rate is 67 cents per hundred of assessed value. How will double debit taxes be collected at closing? All right, so rule number one, first thing is, we don't care what people want for their house. Doesn't matter to us, it's listed, all right? And they might've sold it for that, whatever, but the taxes are gonna be based on the assessed value. Okay, assessed value being 410,000. All right, so let's do this via text to make life easier. So we have 410,000 and we're going to multiply it. We're, now we're in the county, so we don't have to make any changes and it only gave us the county tax rate. We're going to move that decimal place two places over and we're going to multiply it by 0 0.0067, all right? And that means that it's going to give us um, 2747 for the year. That's our yearly taxes, right, annual. All right, so now we have 2747 and we're gonna divide that by 360. We need a daily total, right? We need a daily total. So we divide that by 360, 7.631, all right, per day, okay? Now, we can go out and let's go out and find out, all right, the seller's got till September 28th. Uh, and he owns September 28th. So that means we have January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August. So we have eight full months times 30 is 240 and 28 days in September, 268, right? Anybody argue with that? I don't think, I think we're okay there, all right? So we have 268 days times 7.631, all right? And that's going to give us 2045 and 11 cents. This is going to be the seller's debit. Okay. He's got to pay it. Now, remember we said before, instead of us going and figuring out, we could, if we wanted to, October, November, December, 30, 60, 90, and two days in September, 92 days, we could multiply that out if we wanted to. But why bother? Why not just take the um, 2747 and subtract the 2045 and 11 cents that the seller is going to pay, right? And that's going to leave us with $701.89. And this has got to get paid too. Both of them have to get paid. They have not been paid yet. All right. Double debit means they're not been paid yet. So this is a buyer debit also. Yeah. <clears throat> now, I mean, we could have gone back and done it. The seller owns the closing day. Yes. Seller owns the closing day in this in taxes. And the reason I always hesitate, because when we go to do interim interest, you're going to see that the buyer is going to have to pay interest on the day. Has anybody ever worked or owned a bank or taken out a loan that, that they gave you a free day of interest? No, right? I've never, in all the banks I've ever dealt with, you've always paid, all right? <clears throat> so that's why when we're doing interest, the buyer has to pay for closing day, but that's the only time. Every other time, the seller is going to own the closing day, okay? Because really, in interim interest, the, 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 the seller doesn't have anything to do with the buyer's interest, right? But the bank is going to have everything to do with the buyer's interest, and he's going to want it for the closing day. So everything else is the seller owns the day of closing, okay? So now we, we talked about the taxes, but now what we want to do is we want to talk about legal descriptions. And what you have to understand in a legal description is that if you live at 123 Main Street, that is not the legal description, okay? That's a placeholder. Okay, but legal description wise, it's not. You'll also see next to your name and your address, a lot block and section number. 
you may see it as meets and bounds. Um, if we're west of the Mississippi, we may see it as the rectangular survey system, right? We could do it as a recorded plat, right? So we're going to see all of these things, um, and we'll talk about each and every one of them as we go through it. So um, we want to know what the legal description of this is, all right? And then we're going to get into, as we go through this, transfer of title, deeds, things of that nature, okay? So chapters four and five is where we're going to head now at this particular point. All right. So we want to be able to have a surveyor find a quarter in the middle of your property. What? How's he going to do that? Well, he's going to know, but we got to give him the right instructions. If I told him that one of the monuments at 123 Main Street is a tree, would he ever be able to find that? One of the corners, one of the corners of your property at 123 Main Street is the tree. That might be one of what, 10,000 trees that are on your property? So you got to be, he's got to be able to find those monuments. He's got to be able to find those particular areas. So that's why we need to come up with some sort of system that they can use as a surveyor to find the outliers of your property. So we got four different types that we're going to talk about a little bit. All right. So we need to get to a legal description, right? And we're going to try. It's sufficient if the surveyor can find that parcel. All right. So we're going to talk about meets and bounds. And we'll explain that in a minute or two. And meets and bounds are how we, the 13 original colonies started laying out land. They landed on Plymouth Rock. Now they got to, you know, the butcher got to set up a butcher shop, right? The farmer got to set up a farmer's field. The hat, the hat guy has to go out and hunt beaver pelts so he can make hats. But he's got to have an he's got to have a storefront. Got to have a place to live. We have to mark our territory, right? So that's what we did. We used meets and bounds. Um, a lot of current. Once we get this big piece of property, if you're doing property development, we're going to have a big piece of property that's going to be broken down via um, via meets and bounds. But inside there, we're going to have a community, right? So we're gonna use lot block, right? We're gonna use lot and block, uh, reference to a recorded plat. You could be lot number 25, block number six, subdivision, um, plantation lakes, okay? That could be your description, your property description, right? So that's another word, so inside, so when we downsize it. We can also use a recorded deed page when you record your deed and they're gonna be important to record, all right, we could use a recorded deed page. All right, that had that would be a uh, legal description. And then west of the Mississippi, they use rectangular survey systems, government survey systems, and we'll talk about it. And then ultimately, your street address is about the fifth level here. Um, you can use it <clears throat> if you're listing a house, right? Um, if you're renting a house, I meant to say, not you shouldn't use it for your listings. You have a legal description. You should put it in there, but. If you're using, if you're doing property management, the address is fine. If you're calling Amazon and you want your pro your package delivered, the address is fine. If you're calling an attorney to transfer property, your address is not going to work. You need more than that. Okay. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is meets and bounds. Meets and bounds. So what happens is this. Much like I said before. We had to think about this coming to America, right? And let's use Plymouth Rock for an example. They came, they landed at Plymouth Rock. They all got off the ship, 154 pilgrims got off the ship. They all decided that they were gonna put their mark in the land. Now, you gotta understand that there were reasons that they came here, okay? so. Whether they wanted to be, you know, whether it was political persecution, whether it was just to find a better way, whether it was to be an entrepreneur in a new world, whatever that was, they had skills. So whether they were surveyors, whether they were sailors, where they could do celestial nav navigation, whether they were inventory specialists, they had to get the ship from the United Kingdom to the to the Americas, right? They had to get there. You don't just put out on a boat one day and just say, all right, well, the tide will take us there, right? That's not the way it works. So these folks are pretty bright. 
we don't give them enough credit to get from there to here and still land on Plymouth Rock. Now, there may, their, their goal may have been Hoboken, New Jersey, but they ended up in Plymouth Rock, all right? So that's not too bad. That's pretty close, all things considered, coming across the Atlantic. Well, when they got here, they wanted to put their stake in the new land. So how did they do it? They spread out, right? They spread out. So they spread out to these areas and they say, okay, I am going to start my property. Let's say this here is Plymouth Rock. Let me draw it up here. I do enjoy this. It's kind of fun. All right, so let's say this is Plymouth Rock. So they landed the ship here. That's my, that's the Mayflower. That's as good as I can do. All right, so they landed the Mayflower there. So my uncle Murray goes over and he finds this big boulder on the beachfront and he names it Murray's Rock. So Murray's Rock. He says, I'm gonna start my property right from my rock, right from Murray's Rocks. This big old boulder there. Okay, so we're going to call this our point of beginning. Our point of beginning, right? Murray's Rock. So Murray looks down the down the waterfront, down the way, and he looks 180 feet southeast, and he sees this big old tree there, right? See this big old tree there, and he says, "I think I'm going to mark my property all the way over to that tree." All right, so it's 180 feet from that point from Murray's Rock, but we have to walk on an angle to get to that tree, right? It's not a straight line. So it's south 80 degrees east. If I'm looking at a compass, I'm gonna walk at an 80 degree angle and I'm going to find that tree. So this is my point one, all right? My point number one. Now, I'm gonna turn south and southwest, you notice these are compass points here, right? Uncle Murray walks 160 feet to a big rock that's in the background. He says, I'll use that as my second point. So I got, now I got, I walked south 15 degrees because I didn't walk straight, this is 90. I didn't walk straight, I walked on an angle. All right, I walked on an angle. So I walked 15 degrees southwest, this is southwest, right? All right, there's rock. There's um, there's our rock and point two. Again, we repeated it. We went 85 degrees southwest. Again, we went a little south and we went west to another tree. Point three. We went 151 feet, and then we had to enclose this, right? So, in order to enclose this, what happens? We got to go back to Mary's Rock, right? We got to go back. So. That means we walked four degrees northeast, right? This is not a perfectly straight northeast line. And we walked 199.5 feet. This is meets and bounds, okay? So we used monuments, right? We used trees, we used rocks, we used whatever we could find, okay? Nowadays, um, <laughs> Um, nowadays, they put rebar in the ground, they put a steel uh, pipe in the ground so that a surveyor with a metal detector can find it. Because Uncle Murray's trees and rocks, are they still there? No, they're not still there, right? So they're gone. But we have to get it back to the point of beginning. So this becomes Murray's land, all right? This is where he is. This is his property. So he can farm it. He can put his house up on it. He's, he claimed the land, okay? The Pequot Indians who owned this land before probably aren't so happy, but Murray's happy, and the Mayflowers are happy, right? The Mayflower people, he called dibs on it is exactly what he did, right? Um, so now he's got this, all right? So that's how they did it. And everybody broke off and they kept doing it. So that's how they did this. This is a meets and bounds description. Now, meets and bounds, in this particular case, all right, let me go back here a little bit. The original 13 colonies and Texas used meets and bounds. 
Okay. So we all started at a point of beginning. And it, it, we went around in that big square and we came back, or that big rectangle, and we came back and we finished at that point of beginning. We have this enclosed, okay? So we start and the end place are the same place. Murray's Rock in our example. We're gonna use monuments, fixed objects, rocks, stones, trees, right? And then we're going to use what's called distance and compass points, meets and bounds, meets and bounds. All right, I'm gonna show you what it, what it looks like. Here's what I want you to remember. If I am using feet and I am using compass points, that's a meets and bounds description, okay? That's a meets and bounds description. Um, let's see what we can go, let me... Now this is a little hard to read here, so I'm gonna to go to another one that I have that's much easier to read. Let me see what we got here. It should be here. Anyway. All right. If you look at this legal description right here, all right, right here, this is a meets and bounds description. And it says all at certain piece parcel or lot of land in the Fairview Township, Greenville County, South Carolina on uh, Fairview Road commencing at the place, point on the Northeast corner, compass points of the Frank Smith lot, number nine on the plat, then South, 87-52, right, in that degree, in that general area, north, 286.1 feet to the corner of lot 11, thence north, zero to 58 degrees east, 150 feet to a corner point, then south to um, 2-08, 150 feet, all right, to the point of beginning. Don't worry about having to draw this out or figuring it all out. Just know, just know that this is the type of description we use in our legal descriptions. And it has to do with feet and it has to do with compass points. Okay? So make yourselves a note of that. Okay? Everybody happy? That's the easiest way to read it. I could go back to that other one and I can. Um, I can show you this one all you want, um, and it gets a little more tricky. Uh, northeast corner, the east half of the west half of the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter section, um, range 12 west and runs south to, uh, zero degrees, three feet, eight minutes, east 28 feet to the south right. You all get that? You all want to do that one or just do the compass points and, all right, we're not going to have to do this. Just understand. Yeah, yeah, exactly right probably coll uh, collision investigations, things of that nature. You got to put this all down. But you're not a surveyor. If you're a surveyor, I would expect you to know this because this is how the surveyors live, okay? And this is what they need. If they are doing a huge parcel of land, let's say I'm a builder, I'm a developer, and I go out and I purchase, a, a farmer selling me 300 acres of property. Well, I'm going to want my surveyor to go out and mark that property, right? He's not going to lay out the individual sections of that, but he's going to give me that big old, what's, what's, what's the markers for 300 acres? Okay. He's going to use this. He's going to use the meets and bounds description. That's what the surveyor is going to use. Okay. So that's what that, that's what you're going to need there. Mm -hmm. Everybody good? Do not start freaking out where you're saying, oh my God, there's a lot of numbers. Uh -uh, don't worry about it. Compass points and feet. You need to know that. Original 13 colonies, you need to know that. All right, plus taxes, Tax taxes, plus taxes. All right, plus taxes. All right. Okay, and again, we start at the point of beginning. We just have to make sure we enclose it. And here is your compass points and your feet. All right. Compass points and your feet. How many of you have ever jumped in an airplane on the East Coast and decided to go West? Or on the West Coast and decided to come East and you get along the middle of the country and you say, wow, a lot of squares out there. How'd they do that? 
Well, they use what's called a rectangular survey system. Okay. And this is this rectangular survey system is um, for west of the Mississippi. And what happened was the government through the Louisiana Purchase and the westward expansion and what have you, this was created by Thomas Jefferson, believe it or not. You all remember Thomas Jefferson spent the Revolutionary War in France and then decided to come back and take over politics, right? Wrote our Declaration of Independence, all of those things. Pretty smart guy, right? Stayed out of harm's way for a while, came back and got into it. He created the government survey um, system, rectangular survey system. Now, what he, what he did was, or what Jefferson said was, all right, let's identify this land going west. And if people wanted a patent for the land, as long as they can do, uh, or they're gonna do something, all they have to do is petition the government and we will give them a section of land, okay? And it's all part of the Western expansion. But how do we identify it? Hmm. Well, through navigation, remember I said navigation before about, you know, um, Plymouth Rock and all of that. Well, that's 200 years before Jefferson. So they already know about latitude and longitude, right? That's how they got across the oceans, latitude and longitude. So what they know, Jefferson knows is that, okay, I know each section has a longitude, right? And that's a principal meridian. Those are meridians. And I know they have, um, I'm sorry, these are longitude. And latitude, I know that there's a baselines. So you all starting to see where he's coming from here? He's starting to cut these properties. He's saying, okay, based on this principal meridian and this baseline, we're going to develop a township. And then we're going to break these townships down into smaller, excuse me, smaller sections. All right. So what does that mean? All right. So as America expanded west, need to arose for a survey was possible. All right. Without setting foot out there, Jefferson wasn't going to walk all of those miles, right? So he had to come up with something there, all right? So these are um, grid lines that, um, and every single township is exactly the same size. It is six miles long by six miles wide, okay? Six miles long by six miles wide. These are your townships. All right. Now I will tell you this, you're going to have to under, you're going to need to know some of this stuff. All right. So please understand that principal meridians run up and down north and south baselines run east and west. Inside these six mile by six mile squares, how many individual square miles would we have? If I have something that's six miles long and six miles wide, how many individual square miles would I have? Six by six, how much is that? Six times six, 36, right? So I have 36 square miles inside there, okay? I have 36 square miles in there. So now I have these, inside these townships, I have these 36 sections, square miles, one square mile as a section. Okay, everybody with? All right. So if I told you, I'll give you two things right now. If I tell you that a mile, if you walked a mile, how many feet would you walk? You learned it in fourth grade. You learned it in fourth grade. How many feet is a, a linear mile? You walked it. 5280, right? 5280. Okay. So if I have a piece of property that is 5280 this way and 5280 this way, how many square feet are in there? It's too much to worry about. 
27,878,400 is the number, all right? But let's look at it in acres. The reason I give you the, the, the linear feed is because you can figure that out. 52, was it 5280 times 5280? What does it come to? Put it in your calculator. 27,878,400, right? All right, now, now that you got that in your calculator, how many square feet are in one acre? Does anybody know? 43,560, 43,560. So take your 278,700 and divide it by 43,560. Okay, that's how many square feet are in an acre. So I wanna know how many acres are in my one square mile. Four grandmas do it 35 and a 60. They gave that to me. So yeah, I'm giving it to you. And just remember it that way, because you're going to need to remember that. Four grandmas do it 35 and a 60. Remember those four little grandmas driving that car very slowly in the left-hand lane? And you're trying to cruise through. They're not getting through. So, so we're going to take that 43,560 and divide it into ours. And it's going to give me 640. 640. So there are 640 acres in a one square mile section. Okay, one square mile section. This will make more sense in a second. All right. So we have to know where these sections are. So they, they can tell me that, um, Mr. Jefferson, I want to go put, I want to homestead. Um, I don't know, I want to homestead 20 acres. I want to homestead 640 acres. And he says to me, all right, Sam, that's a rather big farm, but I'll tell you what, why don't you take um, township number 10, take um, uh, section number 33. They'd go out, they'd find where that is, and that would be my property. Now, let's say, that um, Reagan and I are gonna split this property. So I would have, let's say I took the west side, she took the east side. So I would have the west half of section 33 of township number 10. And Reagan would have the other half. So if there's 640 acres in a whole square mile, how many now do I own? 320, right? I own half of it, okay? And then we both decided that we were gonna sell halves of our properties. So George buys a, buys a quarter and James buys a quarter. So now I own the Southwest quarter of the Easter of the Western half, right? See how this is breaking down? And then James owns the northwest quarter of the, um, or the northern quarter of the uh, eastern half. So all these things, we start breaking this down. Now, I own, if I own 320 before and I just split it in half, what do I got now? I got 160, right? So now four of us own section 33 of township number six. We each own 160 acres. And that's how we break it down. And that's how it kept breaking down smaller and smaller and smaller, right down to tenths. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. Now, we're not going to have to do any of those math problems where we're adding all this up. However, you are going to know, need to know that there are six linear mile, a uh, six by six for a township. Six by six for a township. All right. There are 36 one square mile sections in one of those townships. Six miles by six miles, right? Six times six gives me 36 square miles. And each one of those sections has 640 acres. All right. 
And inside one acre, you have 43,560 square feet. Just write those down somewhere. We'll, we'll work with them, all right? Particularly the 43,560, all right? We're gonna need to work with those. And this is what's gonna happen west of the Mississippi, west of the Mississippi. All right, so it looks something like this, all right? In this particular case, here is our township right here. Six miles by six miles, okay? And each one of these numbers are one square mile because we have 36 square miles inside our township. So the property that I would have owned was down here in number 33. So let's take a look at that. We bought right? Reagan and I, and we shared it, right? We bought section 33. So now what we did was let's take a look at how we broke it up. Reagan brought this side of it. I bought that side of it. Okay. I kept this part. Reagan kept this part. We sold James this piece. We sold George this piece. So therefore, we can split it up. Now, if you look, if Reagan wanted to sell her half of what she still has left, couldn't she? She could sell this part, right? And she would be selling the eastern half of the southeast quarter of, the, um, of section 33 in township number whatever one, 10, okay? Now, we have James up here in the corner. He decides he don't want all 160 acres. So if he divides that 160 acres into four quadrants, how many are in each quadrant? 40? Yeah, 40, right? So James says, all right, I'm selling this 40 acres. I'm keeping my 40 acres. And we're going to put the others up for sale. Can he do that? His property, why not? Right? It's his property. So now he can make some money selling his property off of that property. He can sell it off. Because each one of these quadrants, like you see here in George's property, George is keeping all his. He's making a farm. He's going to raise chickens and pigs. Um, and he knows the price of eggs are going to be outrageous. So he's going to get rid of the pigs and just have more chickens. Right? And so he's keeping it. He's keeping it. And he's going to farm the heck out of it, right? So that is how this all breaks out. We can do it, okay? So again, based on principal, uh, principal meridians and baselines, all right, each one of these. Now, I want you to pay attention to one thing. Notice that this number one is always in the northeastern quarter, uh, corner, always. So if we have all of these sec townships, each and every one is going to have the number one in the upper right-hand corner. And also it's gonna have the number 36 in the lower right-hand corner. Okay, so when we look at the number system here, one through six, then they go down, seven through 12, then they go down again, 13 through 18, all right? 19, go down 19 through 24, 25 through 30, 31 back to 36. All right. Anybody know why they did it that way? Back in 1780, 85? Yeah, they wouldn't have to go back to the beginning and walk again, right? They're on horses or they're walking the fields. They don't have, you know, heavy equipment. They don't have cars or anything else like that. Exactly right. So all they did was they said, all right, let's go this way. And then we're going to drop down and go back to the same spot and drop down and come back so that they're not doing all of that. It would take them forever. So they just numbered the sections this way, all right? Because transportation back in 1780 was a horse, maybe a mule, but that's about it. And then you were on foot. If you're a surveyor, that's a lot of work. And these are a mile, so this is a mile wide, right? It's a mile wide, that's a lot of work, a lot of walking. So that's the government survey system. That's how that works, okay? Now, 
like I said, you don't have to remember, just remember that this will, these will always be the same. So if it's um, one, two, three, four, five, six, the next one right next to it will still start in the same direction, right? Number one is always in the upper northeast corner. Number 36 is always in the lower southeast quarter, corner, okay? And then they run concurrently. So when I put another section over here, 13 will be here, 12 will be here, one will be here, right? So they'll always be cut together, always be together. 24 will be there, right? 25 and then 36. They'll always be the same when they butt up against one another, right? 13 will always be against 18. 25 will always be against 30 because that's how they lay out. All right? Any questions on that? Townships are six feet, six miles by six miles. There are 36 one mile square <clears throat> sections in a, um, in a township. Each one is 640 acres. Okay. Each one is 640 acres. And you get that by multiplying linearly 5280 by 5280 and then dividing that by four grandmas doing 35 in a 60. That 43,560 is how many square feet are in an acre. And that's where you get your 640 from. This is the one that you're probably gonna be most familiar with. A reference to a rec uh, recorded plat. This is a lot and block, all right? This is a lot and block. All right, so we're gonna have, our property is going to have a lot block section number or lot block subdivision name, okay? We're gonna have that. If we, are, if we own a property, that's how they're going to use our, um, that's how we're gonna get it, all right? So this is a recorded plat. They're going to record this one phase at a time, all right? So it's a recorded plat or a subdivision plat. So inside that third, um, what did I say? How many acres did I buy before? 30 acres? Well, inside that 30 acres or inside that 300 acres, I think I said, inside that 300 acres, I'm going to build a thousand new homes. Now, can I do a survey on all of those thousand new homes? It's gonna to be tough. It's gonna to take a long, long time, but I'm not gonna do meets and bounds on all of those. I'm gonna draw a map. I'm gonna have an architect or engineer draw up a map that says, this is where I want the um, clubhouse. This is where I want the pool. This is where I want the houses, okay? I want all those things to be around there, all right? so. This is gonna, it's gonna look something like this. All right, we'll go back to the other slides. So if I lived here, it would be lot four, block B, rolling acre subdivision. That would be the legal description of that property. Okay, by lot, block, and section them. All right. So it's gonna be recorded as that. Okay, lot four, block B, rolling acre subdivision, and in the town in which it is. Okay, so it's going to be recorded in the county where the land is located. And this is the easiest for subdivisions, urban property, smaller sections. We can do it this way. It is so much easier just by lot and block. All right. Now, we can also use, you know, a surveyor. We can have it surveyed, all right? And we probably will have each individual lot surveyed, but at least I can have the drawings made up, okay? And I have to I have to submit those plats in order for me to start selling this property. I have to do a preliminary plat to get it to them. Can you imagine how long it would take a survey to do a thousand lots? Pretty much a long time, right? So they're gonna hire to, hire the surveyor to get the big piece of property. We're going to chop it down via engineers' drawings and architectural drawings, chop it down into lot blocks and section numbers, all right? 
and we're going to give it a tax. The county is going to give it a tax map number, right, or a PIN number. We're going to get that. All right. Now, as I finish a phase, let's say I'm going to do these um, thousand houses in five phases, two hundred in each. I'm going to draw up the plans for phase one. I'm going to submit this, right? I'm going to submit this to my county developer, to my county um, council, and all the zoning people. And they're going to, I have to submit it. Once it's recorded, and it, once they agree, once I have a finalized recorded plat, I can't change it. And that's key. I can't change this. So I don't know if you folks have shopped for new homes lately, but they always sell them in sections. Phase one, phase two, phase three. One of the main reasons of that is that if they have to make any changes to phase one, well, they can't make it in phase one because once they record this plat with these houses on it, these 200 houses, it is what it is. But what can they do for phase two? They can go ahead and make all the changes that they needed. Maybe they need more green space. Maybe they need a bigger pool. Maybe they need, you know, whatever it is, right? So they can make those changes for phase two. And then as they learn more, then they can do phase three and then phase four. So they never get stuck. If I did a thousand houses and one plot map, I'm stuck. If I made any mistakes, 1,000 houses are going to be burdened. So I don't want to do that, right? That's why they do it in phases. Uh, one of the reasons. I mean, not, there are obviously other reasons, but one of the reasons that they do it that way. All right. So that once that plat map is recorded, that's it. Can't change it. All right. So the bigger pieces of property are going to be meets and bounds descriptions, right? Rural property. But when we're in subdivisions, when we're in smaller areas, urban land, we're going to do lot blocks and section numbers. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else we got here. All right, so we looked at this. Now, if we've already recorded this, we can go find our recorded plat, right? Under the re recorded deed. All right, under the recorded deed, we can go get that. Now, keep in mind that the deed isn't the title, it's a receipt. You go to Walmart, you pay for your groceries, they hand you a slip of paper, and you go out the front door, meaning you paid for all your stuff. The deed is simply the receipt for you purchasing the home. That's what your deed is. There is no documentation for title. You have that basket full of groceries. There's no documentation there other than you're going to pay for it. The documentation is going to be what? At the end, you're going to get your receipt, right? That's your deed. That's your deed, technically, right? Yes, I have title. I have ownership. All right, I have the bundle of legal rights. How do I prove that? I gotta have a deed. How do I prove that I paid for the groceries? I have to have a receipt, right? Same thing, same principle, okay? So that is proof that that title was transferred, all right? And these deeds are recorded as public evidence. And in this particular case, Susie Seller transferred the title to Bobby Byer. Um, we're going to talk in the next chapter a little bit more about deeds and why we have to record them, okay? Why we have to record them. So we'll get to that. Um, and it, you can go reference to a deed book. We don't use these too much anymore, but they're out there. There are deed books at your county, um, at your registrar of deeds, all right? We can find those out. That's a perfectly legal description because somebody can go and reference that, all right? Now, everybody's got a street address, right? It's okay if you use it in, if you're, um, you put it in your listing contract, that's fine. Although there'll be space for the legal description. You can put it, if you're gonna rent the property, you can use your legal description, that's fine. All right. But you shouldn't use it for the sales contract. That's a legal document between two, um, two people. Should not use it for the sales contract. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about surveys here for a second. These should be prepared by a licensed surveyor, all right? 
And this is going to find any encroachments if you're over the line, which could become title insurance issues. All right. It also can find your flood hazard zone. So all these are important using the survey. Now, I will tell you this. If you buy a house and you have title insurance and you are over the line, let's say you put up 100 feet of fence or the past owner put up 100 feet of chain link fence and he's five feet over on the neighbor's yard and you didn't have a survey when you purchased that house. Neighbor comes over and says, hey, you're over the line on your prop on that fence. you got to get it down. I'm going to sell my property and that fence has to come down. Can you go to your title insurance and say, hey, look, they, you know, this fence is on the, was on the property, it was never found? Not if you didn't get a survey. If it would have been found by having a normal survey, then and you didn't have the survey, title insurance will not cover you particularly in that fence. I had a young lady in a class of ours who um, actually had to take down a hundred feet of chain link fence and move it four feet onto her property. She never had a survey done and she had to bear the expense of taking that down. All right, title insurance wouldn't cover. Never had a survey. So you need the survey. It would have found it. She would have had the survey, would have found that she was four feet, right? Yeah, see, it's not unusual, right? It's not unusual. Kelly said this happened to my parents when the new homeowners moved next door. And it could, it could make both properties not be able to transfer because we have an encroachment that's not resolved. Not resolved. So we can't do anything. So we have to get that fixed. It's really super important. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.